Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are going to start with uh, the second lesson of this uh, module. And we'll start now with uh, an LNG basics, an introduction to, to LNG. Let's see if we can share this presentation here. Okay. Here we are. Okay, now first we start with an introduction of what could be called the background of LNG. LNG with liquefied natural gas, as you all may know, uh, is a, the liquid form of natural gas. LNG is natural gas, just like the gas produced and delivered by pipelines to energy markets around the world. It is called liquefied natural gas because it is a liquid. Obviously, uh, when natural gas is cooled at atmospheric pressure uh, to very low temperatures at about minus 162 degrees Celsius or about minus 260 Fahrenheit, uh, depending on the composition of the pressure to, to very, uh, well, to, of the natural gas, it, it condenses into a liquid. The critical temperature and pressure of natural gas are around minus 82 degrees Celsius and 46 bar. Uh, again, depending on uh, upon the exact composition of the gas. And na natural gas is composed primarily of methane, uh, typically at least 90%. Uh, but may also contain some heavier hydrocarbons, such as ethane, uh, propane, or butane. And typically less than 1% nitrogen. Uh, prior to liquefaction, natural gas is uh, typically conditioned to remove uh, any oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, sulfur uh, compounds, other trace impurities could be such as mercury, for example, and water. Removal of, of those these impurities is the handling of the LNG formed by minimizing corrosion or damage to materials used for its containment. Okay. First of all, we, we could ask ourselves uh, why LNG? And we would say that it, it's mostly because it typically takes about 600 uh, cubic meters of natural gas to do uh, uh, one cubic meter of LNG with one ton of LNG holding the energy equivalent to some five, uh, 50, 50,000 cubic uh, feet of natural gas. Exact conversions depend upon the composition of the natural gas in question. It is the large contraction in volume from the gaseous state uh, to the liquid state that makes LNG much easier and more economical to transport uh, over large distances and store in large quantities. See? And next question would be, is LNG explosive? Uh, well, answering to that question, LNG is not at all explosive or flammable in its liquid state. That's a very important point. And next thing we should ask ourselves, what happens uh, when LNG is warmed? That's very important. Uh, as LNG vapor warms above uh, minus 160 Fahrenheit, that could be minus 106.7 degrees Celsius, it becomes lighter than air and it will rise and uh, disperse uh, rather than collect near the ground. Uh, however, 
it is not explosive unless flammable concentrations of gas occur in enclosed or otherwise confined space. <clears throat> and the next uh, question could be, how much energy does it take uh, to make LNG from natural gas? Well, question is answered with the following. <laughs> it, it typically takes about uh, 10 to 20 percent of gas delivered into an LNG supply chain. It's consumed in the process and, and transportation facilities. This is comparable with long-distance high-pressure gas, gas pipelines. So then, the, what are the main advantages of storing gas as LNG? Well, LNG facilities offer two clear advantages over alternative gas storage options. First, it, it, because LNG facilities can be located above ground, operators and uh, or owners uh, have many more opportunities for locating LNG facilities in comparison with traditional underground gas storage alternatives that depend on underground geological conditions such as depleted reservoirs, aquifers, and salt cover. Secondly, as an advantage, we could say that LNG facilities are often constructed with a higher degree of deliverability, um, the amount of gas the facility can send uh, out and the peak conditions relative to stock inventory. Uh, that, that's the deliverability. And then traditional underground storage facilities. This deliverability provides uh, the opportunity to make demand spikes, sometimes called needle peaks. Let's see. Now, for some facts uh, related to the use of LNG, more or less a kind of uh, history of, of LNG, we could say that LNG has been used for more than 50 years, especially in Asia, Europe, and the United States. Uh, improved technology is now making it more economical to produce, transport, and store LNG in large quantities. These economies of scale have opened up wider markets for its use, where it can be uh, compete where it can compete effectively on price with other sources of fuel. LNG fed by gas from large gas fields remote from gas markets uh, has become an increasingly attractive alternative to oil or pipe gas. Natural gas transported from its country, uh, that, that could be uh, pipe gas, uh, natural gas transported from each country of origin through pipelines. Uh, natural gas uh, as a clean source of energy is becoming the fuel of choice, uh, choice or preference in many regions, if significant volumes uh, can be brought reliably and at competitive prices into a market, enabling it uh, to compete with coal, oil, and petroleum products for power generation and industrial and commercial fields. There is an increasing need globally for diversification of energy supplies due to politics, economics, and reserves. And LNG carriers can be diverted to a number of LNG consuming countries, easily providing high confidence in security of supply from a gas importing nation. See? Now, next question could be, well, how can we keep LNG cold? Well, LNG is stored in large isolated tanks that are designed to minimize any heat ingress. The insulation of the tanks, as efficient as it is, 
does not keep the temperature of LNG at cryogenic temperatures by itself. LNG will stay at near constant temperature if it is kept at constant pressure. So uh, this phenomenon is called auto-refrigeration. Uh, well, as long as the, the LNG vapor boiler is allowed to leave the tank in a safe and controlled manner, the auto-refrigeration process uh, will keep the temperature constant. This vaporization loss is typically, typically collected as it leaves the tank and either were liquefied, uh, sent to the gas line connecting to a gas distribution network, or used as fuel on the site or to power an LNG carry ship. Then the next thing, we have uh, <coughs> differences which should explain uh, between LNG and LPG and LNG and NGL, different concepts. But all of them are light liquid hydrocarbons that can be used as fuel, that's for all of them. But to most non-engineers, the terminology is confusing. Liquefied petroleum gas, which is LPG, it is composed primarily of propane, upward to 95% uh, and small quantities of butane. This is quite different from the primarily methane composition of LNG. LPG is used uh, primarily as residential fuel, petrochemical uh, feedstock and often uh, is used as a vehicle fuel. In fact, LPG remember liquid petroleum gas, um, is a cleaner burning liquid if you will than gasoline. Well, natural gas liquid, NGL, is a light hydrocarbon mixture that may also consist of ethane, propane, butane, and some traces of condensate, which is a heavier gas line range hydrocarbon uh, component. Ethane it can be used for uh, petrochemical production and the remaining portion can be sold as LPG. On the other hand, uh, LPG can be maintained as a liquid by means of elevated pressure alone or by tilting to temperatures to around minus 40 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, it is not possible to liquefy natural gas, which is methane, at ambient temperature, even at elevated pressure. That's the main difference. <clears throat> uh, well, could, uh, despite perceived safety concern, uh, LNG is also safer to handle than LPG in most circumstances. Uh, that's a, a very important point because, uh, well, safety and security is a main part of, of the use of LNG. Well, it, it, we said that LNG is safer to handle than LPG in most circumstances because LPG is heavier uh, than air, so it hangs low to the ground. It leaks uh, occurring in storage facilities. Uh, a leaked low lying cloud of LPG is more easily ignited than LNG. Very important point. In contrast, LNG vapor, primarily methane, is lighter than air. As a result, the revaporized gas stream is an uncontained conditional, typically floats away into the atmosphere and poses a much lower threat uh, of fire or explosion. So that, that's a very important point in, in terms of safety. Now, one of the <clears throat> main sources of, of LNG, I would start with a place where you, you can get this, uh, this LNG. Uh, it comes from Qatar, Indonesia, Australia, Malaysia, Trinidad, Algeria, and Nigeria, 
and uh, well, uh, all of those are leading supporters of LNG. Uh, there are in total some 19 countries that export LNG. LNG is imported by many countries, and in particular, uh, large quantities by Japan and South Korea. And some European countries, with China and India increasing the demand for LNG quite rapidly. Uh, growth in LNG applications uh, depends on expansion of current facilities and new construction and infrastructure investing along the LNG supply chain. The industry has experienced a growth of some 7.5% per year for the past 20 years, and investment commitments uh, suggest this rate of growth uh, will continue for the next decade at least. Well, <laughs> A continued expansion and diversification of LNG supply indicates that a source of LNG uh, will become more readily available in gas consuming markets around the world. The emergence of new LNG import markets in South America, that is uh, Argentina, Brazil and Chile, uh, and the Middle East, we could mention uh, Dubai and Kuwait, in recent years is testament to the diversification of the industry. Floating regasification and LNG storage units uh, have enabled smaller markets to secure LNG imports quickly. I mean quickly, less than a year. Without building land-based uh, LNG receiving terminals. Okay. Uh, this approach uh, has now become more popular with, with countries seeking to import occasional or seasonal uh, LNG cargoes. Demand of LNG is expected to increase as emission restrictions uh, favor gas over coal for power generation, and gas supply companies make inroads into uh, niche markets such as uh, road vehicle fuel, as a marine vessel fuel, and as uh, LNG replaces propane as a fuel uh, for facilities not connected to the pipeline gas. Now, the LNG supply chain. Uh, the LNG supply chain, well, it, it, it includes all facility and equipment involved in taking natural gas from an underground reservoir, liquefying it and transporting it to an end user customer of natural gas. That supply chain is typically uh, long in terms of distance and expensive in terms of the capital cost of the equipment and facility involved. Um, the components of this supply chain typically include, uh, well, uh, gas field production uh, infrastructure, feed gas pipeline to gas processing and conditioning plant, a large scale refrigeration plant involving heat exchangers to liquefy the feed gas, LNG storage and port loading facilities, because everything must be kept cold, remember. LNG marine tankers, LNG receiving terminal including port and loading, LNG storage, regasification, and gas send out compression facilities. They also uh, a connection to a natural gas transmission and distribution network to deliver gas to customers. And in some cases, distribution of LNG by truck to small remote of uh, off grid gas customers. Now we should ask ourselves if can can LNG compete commercially with pipeline gas? The whole question has a clear answer. Yes, yes, LNG can compete commercially with pipeline gas. And LNG supply chain 
that is gas field development, liquefaction plant, transportation by LNG carrier, LNG terminal, is generally set up uh, when pipeline transmission is uh, uh, too expensive due to the long distances involved uh, or the technical or political difficulties of pipeline construction or to enable the gas to be delivered to more than one geographic market location. LNG supply chains are much more flexible than gas pipelines, being able to serve different markets at different times and avoid the political and geopolitical instability of transit countries that uh, transcontinental gas pipelines have to deal with. Then, the commercial terms of LNG. Well, in traditional energy markets, buyers and sellers are generally linked by long-term contracts, that is, uh, 10 to 25 year duration, typically, mm, for pre uh, predefined quantities of LNG produced in a leak fraction plant and received at an LNG terminal specified in the contract. Usually penalties for the customer not taking the contract quantities take or pay. The contracts usually specify a price often linked to benchmark gas prices or to other fuel crude oil prices or inflated from an initial floor price. Rapidly growing short-term markets are changing this as a more uncontracted. LNG carrying vessels and the market. However, the LNG market will remain dominated by long-term contracts for the foreseeable future. Short-term LNG cargo sales amount to about 50% of the overall LNG supply. Well, now to the LNG rectification terminals, which we have in the here in, in, in the screen. Uh, an LNG reclassification terminal is where the LNG is delivered to the, to the end users, which typically comprises the LNG unloading jetty and LNG storage and sender facility, along with heating to reconvert LNG back to natural gas. The reclassification process is a heating process typically using ambient temperature that heats most terminals uh, use uh, seawater for heating. And in some terminals, ambient is uh, it's also used. In cold climate regions, fuel gas is necessary to supplement heating during the winter months. The LNG terminals uh, typically unload the LNG shipment in uh, 10 to 12 hours in order to minimize the docking times for the ships and reduce the operating cost of the ship. Yeah. Well, let's see. How are terminal, uh, terminals designed? Okay. Well, all LNG start facility designs must comply with stringent regulations as required uh, by legislation called. Uh, well, in accordance with safety standards, uh, vapor dis dispersions distances must be calculated to determine how far downwind a natural gas cloud could travel from an onshore storage uh, facility and still be flammable. As required, required by these regulations, uh, these exclusion zones must not reach beyond a property line uh, where other development uh, could occur. Since a fire uh, would burn with intense heat, it's 
onshore LNG container and LNG transfer systems must also have thermal exclusion zones established in accordance with prevailing safety standards. Uh, these exclusion zones must be legally controlled by the LNG facility operator or a government agency to ensure adequate separation between members of the public and the heat from a fire. In other terms, we sometimes should consider, it's not uh, typically done in Spain, for example, but we have to consider the seismic design requirements. Well, uh, in that case, uh, LNG facilities must meet uh, stringent, standard, stringent sorry, standards to ensure public safety and plant reliability in the event of an earthquake, which is not very common in Spain, but, well, it should be considered for somewhere else. Extensive studies of the geological conditions and earth history of a proposed LNG site are required to determine appropriate design loads on the critical components of the LNG plant, such as the design of the LNG storage tanks. Well, now, what what should gas markets do? Uh, well, what, what gas markets do? LNG regasification facilities serve. We could say some LNG facilities have the flexibility uh, to participate in several markets at once. For example, some uh, fill both base and load and big shaving loads. Some also provide LNG for commercial vehicle fuel. Uh, which is growing in demand since the LNG fuel cost is significantly less than petroleum fuel that has been escalating in price. Now, uh, next question to be yeah. here. Here we are. Uh, now, one more question for. Uh, um, we should ask uh, how long can LNG be stored at LNG regasification terminals? And that's an important question. Um, scheduling for both the arrival of the LNG shipment and the dispatch of the regasified product generally is necessary to maintain an optimum operation of the LNG facility. A balance of multiple sources of LNG supply and storage capacity to match the variations in consumption is essential to minimize the inventory shortage that might be brought around by weather or tank scheduling problems. Typically, the regasified LNG is sent out to customers on a routine schedule under a contract that calls for a set daily volume. Consequently, the LNG may be in storage at a marine import terminal for only a few days, and depending on the terms of the individual contracts and the time of the year, it, seldom, it, it is seldom held for more than a few months, unless it is held only for emergency back. Well, what is an LNG big shaving plant is a very important point. Such facilities typically involve a, a small liquefaction unit with a large LNG storage tank and gas center facilities to a gas distribution network capable of responding to gas peaks or supply crisis. However, some big shaving plants receive their LNG in liquid form uh, by ship or by truck from other LNG facilities and do not have liquefaction facilities of their own. Uh, typically, gas is taken from a pipeline supply and liquefied and stored as LNG at the big uh, shaving plant. 
energy remains in storage for several months. And in most cases, it is only used to supply the extreme demand periods or needle peaks of just a few days each winter. Peak shaving plants are used by gas utilities and regional pipeline companies as a means of storing gas in liquid form for peak periods and emergency backup. They are usually located at strategic points uh, within the supply network to enable rapid delivery of gas to key markets. Well, now let's go to the very important question. Question should be, are there emissions from an an LNG regasification terminal, as you mentioned, a very, very important to consider. Well, during the operation of an LNG regasification terminal, atmospheric emissions are mainly combustion emissions resulting from the burning sulfur-free natural gas. LNG terminals are typically subject to regulation set by uh, the government environment agency. Uh, authorization for a specified level of emission is typically granted by such agencies uh, once they are satisfied that the best available techniques are being employed in the operation of uh, a terminal to eliminate, minimize, and render harmless any resulting emissions to the environment. No. LNG safety. Well, the LNG LNG safety safety records. The LNG industry has long and excellent safety record due to strict industrial safety standards uh, applied worldwide. Well, up to 2012, there were some uh, 50,000 LNG carry voyages. voyages without a significant accident or safety problem, even for the, the high seas. Uh, well, we have to mention two major act accidents that impacted the LNG industry. The first was a Cleveland LNG storage facility, which, was, which is located in the United States in 1944, so a long time ago. And the Skikta liquefaction plant located in Algeria in 2004. Uh, well, uh, we will have a, a, a bit of a description of those uh, incidents uh, soon afterwards. Well, in most jurisdictions, safety case and environmental impact study reports are required by the government's regulatory authorities before a consent for building an LNG facility is granted. Well, the, the, the safety case considers all aspects of management, handling facilities, and operation of the plant, particularly on potential accidents and how major accidents will be prevented. Fires are more likely at liquefaction plants than regasification terminals, but are extremely rare. Well, as uh, well as part of the safety, well, and safety case and environmental impact studies, critical LNG spill incidents are the subject of risk analysis to review and assess the suitability of the site and the design of an LNG facilities at any access waterway and road network. Modern LNG facilities are designed and operated such that persons not involved in the operation of the facility, including ships that are outside the clearly designated safety and excursion, excursion zones, would not be at risk should these critical incidents occur. A rapid response planning to potential incidents by emergency services and training of responders is also well, part of the safety systems put in place for LNG facilities. Well, now for the 
the, well, the, 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 the tank failure in 1994, we're going to talk about the, what, what caused the Cleveland LNG tank failure in 1944. Well, uh, sorry. Now, the, the East Ohio Gas Company built the world's first LNG peak shaving facility in Cleveland in 1941. It consisted of three small spherical LNG storage tanks covered by cork insulation and a mild uh, steel outer shell. The tanks were supported by in, uninsulated uh, mild steel legs. The facility adjoined um, a residential neighborhood. The facility was run without incident until 1944. I mean, three years running without any problem, the first three years. And then uh, a, a larger new tank was added in that 1944. Since Stainless steel uh, alloys uh, were scarce because of shortages resulting from World War II. The new tank um, was built using a toro segmented design using low nickel content, about 3.5% uh, uh, alloy steel, um, shortly after going into service. On the 20th of October 1944, sorry, the tank failed. LNG spilled uh, into the street and storm sewer system were uh, vaporized. Uh, vaporizing gas ultimately made an ignition source and ignited. The resultant uh, fire killed 128 people. Well, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Mines investigations in 1946 uh, that allowed uh, showed that the accident was due to the low temperature embrittlement of the inner shell of the cylindrical tank. The in inner tank uh, was made of uh, well uh, 3.5 nickel steel, a material now known uh, to be su uh, susceptible to brittle fracture at LNG storage temperature. Uh, uh, that was, uh, remember that that was uh, below uh, 100, uh, 160 degrees Celsius, uh, 260 Fahrenheit. Had the fourth Cleveland tank been built using appropriate materials, the investigation concluded that the tragic accident would not have happened. So, LNG tanks constructed around the wall uh, of 9% nickel steel have never had brittle crack failure over the decades of subsequent operation. Well, cl clearly th there is no reason why such an accident should be repeated. And, well... <laughs> Now we're going to describe what caused the Skikta uh, liquefaction train fire in 2004, which is much more recent. Well, on 19th of January 2004, a leak in the hydrocarbon refrigerant uh, system at one of the natural gas liquefaction units, 340, in Skikta, Algeria. Algeria, uh, from uh, a vapor cloud that was uh, ingested into the inlet of the combustion fan uh, of a steam boiler. The hydrocarbon acted as increased fuel to the boiler, causing a rapidly rising pressure using the steam generating equipment. The rapidly rising pressure uh, quickly exceeded the capacity of the boiler safety, uh, safety valve. Uh, and this, uh, the steam uh, drum rotor, uh, which uh, tearing apart uh, the boiler firefox and housing. The flames from the boiler firefox ignited 
uh, the leak refrigerant, refrigerant gas, which was confined by the equipment and structures in the area, uh, producing an explosion and ensuing fire. The explosion, along with the shrapnel from the ruptured uh, steam drum, caused further damage to the process uh, piping and pressure vessels in the immediate area, leading to additional flammable uh, fluid release. The fire uh, took eight hours to extinguish, which is quite a lot. But with explosions and fire destroyed a portion of the LNG plant and caused 27 deaths and injured to 72 more. No one outside the plant was injured, nor were the LNG storage tanks damaged by the hydrocarbon explosions. Uh, well, uh, there was a joint report issued by the US Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission, the FERC, and the US Department of Energy, DOE, was issued in, in April 2004. Uh, the accident was in January, so three months later. And the findings in that report indicate the following things. First, there were uh, ignition sources in the process area. There was a lack of typical automatic equipment shutdown devices required uh, by modern design codes. There was a lack of hazard detection devices uh, which should have provided advanced warning of the refrigerant leak and help to prevent the explosion. Well, well the skip the loop version trains 10, 20, and 30 have been upgraded in the late 1990s. Train 40 was, in fact, of an obsolete design and scheduled for demolition at the time of the incident. Train 40 was originally built in 1981 and not well maintained, in fact. The poor maintenance, uh, obsolete design, and poor general condition of skip that train 40 suggest that such an incident should not be repeated in a modern liquefaction plant. But nevertheless, uh, the incident uh, highlights uh, the need for comprehensive maintenance schedules and appropriate hazard detection systems at LNG facilities. Well, we could well also talk about other serious incidents that have occurred at LNG regasification terminals while to, to well, as to speak in terms of uh, safety of the, of the facilities. In addition to, to that uh, happening in Cleveland, there have been uh, two other incidents attributed to LNG. A construction uh, accident on Staten Island in 1973, uh, well, has been cited by some parties as the LNG accident because the construction crew was working working inside an empty uh, warm LNG tank. In another case, um, the failure of an electrical seal on an LNG pump in 1979 permitted gas, but not LNG, permitted gas to enter an enclosed building. As part of indeterminate uh, origin, it caused an explosion in the building. As a result of the incident, the electrical code was revised for the design of electrical seals used with all flammable fluids on the person. All this, this record, in fact, suggests that LNG offers a safe and reliable source of natural gas and facilities can be located close to urban areas with confidence that they do not pose significant safety risks. Now, we should mention LNG carriers in terms of, of safety, uh, saying that LNG carriers have double-hold uh, containment systems, 
uh, to limit loss of containment in case of collision or grounding. LNG uh, carrier, uh, carrier safety equipment uh, includes sophisticated radar and positioning systems uh, that alert the crew to other traffic and hazards around the ship. A number of distress systems and beacons uh, will automatically send out signals if the ship is in difficulty. The cargo system safety features um, include an extensive instrumentation package that, uh, sorry, that safely shuts down uh, the system if it starts to operate out uh, of predetermined parameters. Well, ships um, are also equipped with gas and fire detection system. Uh, crews are extensively trained and should be to maintain high levels of onboard safety and how to handle emergency situations if they should arise. Three LNG cargo tank types uh, are well currently used in LNG carrier ships that are self-supporting spherical self-supporting prismatic SPP and membrane. The membrane tanks are the most common in vessels built over the past decade and very few vessels have been built with self-supporting prismatic tanks. Although there is renewed interest in such design for floating liquefaction vessels. For all cargo types, Penetrating one or more LNG uh, cargo tanks in a collision or grounding requires the penetration of the, the things that I'm going to mention. Well, uh, first, uh, the ship's outer hull, uh, the three meter or so space between the outer and inner hulls, and uh, the, the water pass tanks. The inner hull, the installation uh, system around the LNG cargo tank, uh, the secondary containment of the individual LNG cargo tank, the installation system around the primary containment, and the primary containment vessel of the individual LNG cargo tank. Well, now we, we should mention of course the, the sizes of LNG carriers and terminals. Well, LNG import terminals are equipped with storage tanks capable of holding at least one tank load of LNG, and most modern facilities typically have a capacity of uh, at least two tank loads. Well, in case of uh, modern large uh, LNG carrier ships or tankers, commonly hold some 145 cubic, cubic meters of LNG in liquid form, which equates to well, about 3 BCF uh, well, in gaseous form. LNG vessels range uh, in capacity from uh, 19,000 to 25,000 cubic meters. The, well, the largest uh, vessels uh, are up to uh, 265,000 cubic meters uh, have come in, came to service uh, in 2008. Uh, LNG carriers uh, are large double hull ships, um, several hundred meters in length, with, which travel at average speeds of 70 to 20 knots. Well, consider that 18 knots are 33 kilometers per hour. Um, it takes around 10 hours to fill an LNG tanker with a capacity of 120,000 cubic meters. Large, uh, larger vessels uh, require higher capacity uh, loading infrastructure to enable rapid uh, loading of cargoes. 
below the, the starts of, of uh, the storage tanks at an LNG marine terminal often function as LNG storage facilities. The principal operation of an import terminal is not uh, for gas storage, but rather for receiving the waterborne LNG imports and then regasifying LNG for shipment via uh, pipelines to customers. Well, Going back to the safety points, uh, we didn't mention uh, LNG carrier groundings and collisions occurred. Uh, well, as a, a very few incidents involving LNG ships have occurred, and those that have occurred uh, have not resulted in loss of containment. The following example illustrates uh, the robustness of these vessels. And the pressing over bridging and LNG ship tanks is extremely difficult. Well, in 1979, the El Paso Paul Kaiser loaded uh, with uh, about 125 uh, cubic, uh, cubic meters of LNG was um, <coughs> steaming out of the, of the Mediterranean Sea from the Algerian port. He was traveling at approximately nine knots off the coast of, of Gibraltar when it struck a rock outcropping below surface and got as well at about 750 foot long scar in its hull. This serious marine incident did not involve a loss of cargo, nor did it uh, result in a breach of an LNG tank. The grounding did not even penetrate the outer hull. Another ship was brought alongside. The cargo was pumped out of the El Paso Paul Kaiser uh, into the second ship. The El Paso Paul Kaiser was righted and sent to the shipyard for repairs and eventually returned to service. Now, let's consider now some possibility of LNG spills, this is the last one, consideration of LNG spills. Well, in order to be ignited, in order to be ignited, LNG must first be vaporized, which is heated and returned to a vapor state. That, 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 that's the meaning of vaporized, which I didn't mention before. Mixed with between 5 to 15 percent air and come in contact with an ignition source. Uh, well, were LNG to be released onto the ground as a consequence of a leak from starch tank, uh, the heat from the ground surface would initially cause a very rapid volume in the uh, of the LNG. As the ground cools, the boiling rate of the LNG would reduce. The amount of vapor formed uh, would be in direct proportion to the amount of LNG released. The rate of release and the surface area covered in release. In an unconstrained uh, unconstrained, sorry, open air environment, the cold gas vapor will condense, will condense most, uh, most of the water, which is uh, humidity, in the surrounding air, uh, forming a white vapor cloud. If, if uh, unhindered, the cloud will drift in the direction of the wind, further mixing with the air and picking up uh, heat from both the ground and the air as it moves. As the vapor cloud warms up, warms up sorry, it will become uh, buoyant, that means lighter than air, and rise into the atmosphere where typically it will gradually disperse without ignition. It's a very, very important point. For safety. Well, LNG released on water acts very similarly to the initial release on land. 
assuming a large volume of water, the vapor formation rate will remain uh, high as the surface water that is cooled by the LNG sinks and is replaced by uh, warmer water. Hence, in unconstrained scenarios, spilled LNG should not typically ignite. Ignition is possible only in certain zones, in certain zones sorry, of an LNG vapor cloud where uh, mixing with air would produce a flammable gas uh, in the uh, well about 15% uh, concentration in air range. At the center of the cloud, the air quantity is too low for ignition. At the outer limit uh, of the cloud, the air quantity is too high for ignition. Natural gas has an auto ignition temperature, temperature range sorry, of uh, approximately 590 degrees Celsius to 650 degrees Celsius. Transforming that into Fahrenheit, it could be uh, 1,100 uh, to 1,200 Fahrenheit, more or less, which is higher than LPG and significantly higher than gasoline. Those are the fuels also ignite with lower concentrations in air. For example, uh, gasoline. It has a lower flammability limit, uh, lower flammability L, LFL, of only 1.4%, uh, and propane is 2.1%, meaning, meaning that both can be ignited with significantly lower concentrations in air uh, than natural gas, which has an LFL, remember, lower flammability limit of 5%. If the limited uh, flammable portion of a natural gas vapor, vapor cloud in an unconstrained environment met an ignition source, it would burn but not explode, which is very important. Well, in order for the ignition of an LNG vapor cloud to result in an explosion, uh, the gas must first be and informally mixed with air in the 5 to 15 percent range, confined in an enclosed space, and then ignited uh, through a contact uh, with an ignition shock. Well, it is extremely unlikely that such conditions uh, could it could all occur together in a modern LNG facility. Considering all, all, well, all the measures that we mentioned before that should be, should be taken and, and considered in, in LNG facilities. Well, now we, we have now to, to to talk about what are the, the likely impacts of large LNG spills. Uh, well, there have been some uh, detailed risk analysis studies, and in general, uh, those studies examine the vulnerability of LNG tankers and the impact of an intentional or accidental event that spills a large amount of LNG into a carrier or onto the water. As part of the research, um, well, it, it was said that uh, a very large LNG fire in a 120 meter diameter pool uh, that was made for the purpose. The, well, the, there was a test for LNG spill that was uh, 83 meter in diameter and created a 56 meter diameter fire. The test also showed that the fire would likely stay attached to the ship instead of floating away. 
Well, modeling associated with uh, the previously mentioned studies uh, showed that uh, about 40% of spilled LNG could stay within the ship, causing cryogenic and heat damage. At high temperatures, the strength of the steel of the ship is much reduced. On the other hand, the extreme cold temperature of LNG is likely to cause factors in all structural elements in and around the ship that come into contact with LNG. The largest intentional breach events modeled uh, uh, would cause significant damage and make the vessel unseaworthy. The study uh, mentioned before uh, considered um, a wide range of events, including shorted fire weapons, stinger missiles, uh, backpack explosives, underwater events, and small aircraft. The estimated uh, thermal hazard distances, even from a pool fire associated with the largest capacity LNG carriers in operation, involve significant impact uh, to public safety and poverty contained uh, within approximately 500 meters of a spill with lower public health and safety impact at distances beyond approximately 1,600 meters. However, uh, the, studies, uh, the studies have found that uh, pool fire and vapor dispersion hazard distances are significantly influenced uh, by site-specific environmental, topographical, climatic and operational conditions, including the bridge and spill size. Now, then, well, that should be, what should be done if there is spill from an LNG delivery truck? To different, different issue. Well, truck loading and transport of LNG carries a higher risk than normal pipeline delivery, but involves a relatively small limited amount of LNG. First, uh, responders uh, need to be trained to treat uh, such a spill because pouring water on an LNG pool results in a large increase of LNG vaporization. A better approach is to confine a spill with quick, simple methods uh, such as placing sandbags in ditches. Well, application of firefighting foam is not too effective once an LNG pool fire is ignited, but it can limit the evaporation rate of a pool prior to ignition. Right. Uh, blocking traffic is important uh, to reduce ignition sources from hot engine and mufflers. Um, if ignition occurs, an explosion is very unlikely unless the vaporized LNG cloud drifts uh, indoors into buildings. Well, now we have to consider it, well, what are the, the safety concerns of LNG spills? Well, first, uh, because it, of its cryogenic temperature, um, atmospheric uh, boiling uh, point approximately, well, uh, uh, minus 160 degrees Celsius. Uh, LNG poses exposure concerns uh, to employees, uh, facility structure and equipment, the design and operation uh, of LNG terminals it minimized uh, ignition sources, thus cryogenic exposure is more likely than a fire incident. This is particularly true in the high pressure processing areas but where the fluid uh, inventory is lower but the higher pressure creates greater potential for cryogenic exposure. 
cryogenic exposure can cause freeze burns uh, to employees. Gas from LNG vaporization is extremely cold and can produce irreparable burns on delicate tissues such as those of the eyes. Therefore, unprotected parts of the body should not be allowed to touch an insulated pipes of vessels containing LNG. The cold LNG vapor can also cause embrittlement to carbon steel, thus possibly resulting in structural failure. Protection from cryogenic exposure with isolation, sorry, insulation, as well from fire exposure is installed in the facility. Protective measures should be chosen that are effective for both fire and cryogenic exposure. The other safety concern is asphyxiation. The normal oxygen uh, content offered is 20.9% in volume. Atmosphere containing less than 18% are potentially asphyxian. In the case of ga gas leakage, uh, the high concentration of gas can cause nausea or dizziness uh, from anoxia. In an LNG facility, oxygen and hydrocarbon content of the atmosphere are constantly uh, monitored to detect uh, any gas leakage. For maintenance of equipment, the operator is equipped with instruments to ensure sufficient oxygen is uh, present before entry to any equipment. Well, we're approaching the end. <laughs> well, now, how would an LNG facility be safeguarded against damages from an LNG spill. Well, we should say then that direct contact of LNG with structural steel can rapidly cool the material to below embrittlement, tem uh, embrittlement temperature and may quickly cause failure uh, in a short time. For this reason, the construction and protection system material is selected to withstand cold temperatures and must, must comply with the most stringent LNG standards. Insulation, shielding and detection systems are provided in the facility uh, to limit the volume of LNG release and mitigate the spread of LNG over the uh, greater area. In the United States, for example, NFPA 15NA is one of the key design documents for the design of the LNG facilities. In Europe, it is BS in 1473, which is normally used in Europe. Uh, both documents require that equipment and structures whose failure would result in incident escalation must be protected from cryogenic uh, in Now, each country has its own regulations and agencies responsible for marine vessel security. For example, in the United States, FERC is among several federal agencies agencies overseeing the security of LNG terminals and peak shaving plants. The Coast Guard has the responsibility for LNG shipping and marine terminal, terminal security. The OT's pipeline and hazardous material safety administration, which is the acronym is BHMSA, and the Department of Homeland Securities Transportation Security Administration, which is uh, the acronym is uh, um, TSA, have, uh, have a security authority for LNG peak shaving facilities. 
in, in addition to federal agencies, um, state and local authorities provide security assistance at LNG facilities. Uh, now, security measures for both onshore and offshore portions of marine terminals are required by Coast, Coast Guard regulations under the Maritime Transportation Security Act. Requirements for maintaining security of LNG terminals are in the Coast Guard regulations. Well, that's in the US. Uh, while well, the, the Coast Guard keeps other ships and boats uh, from getting near LNG vessels while in transit or docked uh, by enforcing regulated navigation areas and security zones. The Coast Guard uh, uh, performs a number of important security and safety checks uh, before allowing an um, LNG tanker uh, to enter a port and unload its LNG. Facilities are required to have a, a written security plan and an emergency response plan. FERC, DOT, and the Coast Guard require LNG companies to contact and coordinate procedures with local response organizations. And now, finish with this presentation. Well, we have to well, consider the risk of terrorism at, uh, well, to uh, new dimension to LNG safety risk. The LNG business has an admirable safety record overall, as we mentioned before. But a whole new dimension has been introduced since, well, since those terrorist attacks in September 11, 2001. And by the nature of all those tax and the, well, the nature also of uh, LNG import terminals, well, it, terminals are likely to be near centers of population and issues of public protection and public acceptance of new terminal proposals have high community profiles. Uh, how much LNG could conceivably be released in a major incident? How quickly and how far might the pool spread? And how fast does it vaporize to gaseous methane? Also, and what is the maximum size and intensity of any resulting fire? These are, well, questions typically addressed in accessing the potential impact of terrorist attacks. And, well, also, we have to say that these questions are typically addressed in the planning, siting, and design of modern LNG input terminals. Well, on my part, this this is all for this for this class. Uh, well, it was a bit shorter than well than you know, I I presume, but I think that the, the most uh, important issues are treated in the presentation. Though I gave many more details just to give uh, well, uh, further information on, well, on, on those uh, issues that I consider very, very important in, in this case. So all that, that, that's all for now. Thank you very much to all of you. Bye-bye.